Hello, this is Jeff Gadiosi, and you're on MisplacedStraws.com, where music comes to life. And my guest today is really one of the great songwriters of his generation. He's about to release his 13th record called The Horses and the Hounds, and I can guarantee that you'll be seeing it on many year-end best lists. I'm so happy to be talking to him about it today. Please welcome James McMurtry. Welcome, James. Good to be here. <laughs> So The Horses and the Hounds, I mean, it's a great record. It's been six years since your last record, Complicated Game, and after, before that was five years since the record before that, Just Us Kids. Prior to that, you were on sort of a record a year pace. Um, why the delay? Quite, I don't think it was quite that. <laughs> Not was, a record it, a year. Well, I've never been that fast. But no, the delay, basically, I mean, that first long gap was because I didn't need to make a record because my tour draw held up just fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I started making records in 1989, the strategy was, uh, you know, we toured to support record sales, hoping we'd sell enough records to live off the royalties. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that didn't happen with me. But over the course of time, I learned to tour cheap. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been the other way around. So, you know, I, I, I make records on the commercial from a commercial standpoint i make records to support tour dates mm -hmm. because if i got a record out and you know, i can get press and you know you guys yeah. will want to talk about the record and when i come to town people will know i'm there and they'll go buy tickets mm -hmm. um, and that came in handy about the time you know when napster and spotify flipped the music business on its head i was already doing what everybody else was having to learn to do so mm -hmm. um, but anyway you know it, it, there was a long gap there where we didn't we didn't need a record uh, after you know, um, we can't make it here. Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, we we had a pretty good run, and then it started to tail off. So I, I, I made the complicated game record, and mm -hmm. this record got backed up by the pandemic. We we actually tracked this in uh, June of 2019. Oh wow! And spent for, you know most of the fall piecemeal doing overdubs because Ross Hogarth, the producer, is pretty busy, and mm -hmm. we were pretty busy touring at the time, so we'd have to you know. I'd fly out to L.A., do some vocals, fly home, get back in the van, mm. that sort of thing. And, you know, finally we we just about, we, we were down to just a few keyboard parts. And we had, you know, a session booked at Sunset Sound in L.A. And, and then uh, about a week before we were supposed to go in, uh, L.A., you know, California shut down. Mm -hmm. And then everybody else shut down. So we had to do the keyboards kind of piecemeal over time. Uh... I ran one of those sessions out over in Dripping Springs, Texas with Buck Allen, and then we had a couple other guys playing B3, mm. emailing tracks in, which takes a while, because, mm. you know, you, you, if you're not in a room with a player, you know, he sends in a track, you listen to it, you say, well, you got to call him back, say, hey, fix yeah. this, or do something, you know, it can take days where it should take an hour. Yeah. So, that's that sort of thing. And even when you're on the breaks between actually putting a record out and on the road, are you always writing? I mean, are songs no. <laughs> always coming? <laughs> well, the snap pieces of songs coming. Yeah. But I, I don't sit down and write really usually till it's time to make a record. I start feeling that pressure. Mm. You know? And this and, time was total pressure because you know, when I started out making records, you know, I was young and I, I could, you know, I thought I could write in the studio and I got away with it sometimes. And, and Ross was around then. He, uh, Hogarth was, uh, he was John Mellencamp's engineer mm -hmm. when I met him. So he recorded and mixed my first two records. And the second one was pretty much, I went in, you know, seven songs kind of half-baked and finished them in the studio with the band on the clock. And you can do that when you're 29. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, Ross called up, I guess, uh, early 2019. He said, look, you know, we've, we've been messing around with this for a while, and, and I can get a session at Groove Masters, which is, you know, Jackson Brown's place, but mm. we got we have this one window of time we have to hit, otherwise it's booked up. So we're going to book that time, and you're going to write the songs. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I know you'll do it. You'll finish yeah. it. And he said that, and I, I turned into the dog from the Jetsons, you know, asking, you know, <laughs> <laughs> ruh, -ruh. <laughs> ruh, -ruh. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but I, I got it done, so... Mm. Barely. I mean, I, I was riding in a in a roadway in in Culver City, which is where we stayed for the tracking session. Mm -hmm. And the, the locals call it Roadkill Inn because there was a hostage incident where the <laughs> L.A. SWAT team shot some guy through the upstairs window. And I was in a downstairs room and it wasn't haunted or anything, but uh, 
But it was like it's kind of like going back to the old days, and mm. and um, but you know sometimes that's what gets the songs written. Yeah, it's like you're on the school bus getting your homework done. Mm. And you've never been known to steer away from political commentary in your songs. Um, you went pretty hard after George Bush, you know, back then with a couple of well, tracks. See, <laughs> um, I started that song under Clinton. <laughs> Yeah. The first lines that I wrote for yeah. We Can't Make It Here were during the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. And what the narrator really rails about is, is outsourcing. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't finish it till the Bush administration was... Mm -hmm. And Bush didn't do anything different because his buddies were getting just as rich off the outsourcing as mm -hmm. Clinton's were. But, mm -hmm. you know, it came out during the Bush administration, so everybody thought it was specifically an anti-Bush mm -hmm. song. And I didn't mind that much because I wasn't any fan of... Yeah. Of little George, but <laughs> well, on this record, I mean, considering everything this country has gone through since Complicated Game came out, really, with the possible exception of Operation Nevermind, you sort of steered clear of you know, kind of the low hanging fruit for song topics. I didn't steer anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I write the songs, you know, I, I make a record out of how whatever songs got finished in time to make mm -hmm. a record. <laughs> if none of them happen to be political, then it's not going to be a political record. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, it's not just songs. I mean, you also write a column on Americana Highway called Wasteland Bait and Tackle. And is that sort of the form to get out kind of your immediate observations and frustrations rather than putting them into song? Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes they'll get into song, but, you know, I don't decide to write a song about a certain topic. Mm -hmm. I start with a couple lines and a melody. And if it's cool, I follow it to its rational conclusion and uh, you know and, and sometimes it, there'll be political slants in them that i don't agree with mm -hmm. but i have to stay in character to write a good song you know there was that song carlisle's hall about the waterman you know and and uh, griping about government regulations on fisheries well i happen to think we should regulate fisheries if mm -hmm. we want to keep them but i don't make a living trying to drag fish and crabs out of a bay you know <laughs> So, and the character in the song does. So I had, you know, if I mm -hmm. break character, I'm going to lose the song. You know. And one thing that always strikes me about your songs is you have that ability to take an entirely developed story and narrative and distill it down to three or four minutes. Whereas sometimes you don't see that type of development in a full movie or a novel. I mean, what is it about the art of a song that allows you to tell such a complete story? Well, you can do anything in three verses. You know, it's like, you know, you got a beginning and a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. Or if you go back to, you know, high school English, you know, you got an introduction and a body and a conclusion. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's sort of the same structure. Mm -hmm. And But you, you, you put in verses, you put in choruses and bridges now and then to make it lift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make it sing better, make it more interesting. Well, I have to say, you know, with the new record, the first single, Canola Fields, the, that line in the chorus, you know, just take a death grip on some part of me. I mean, just the depth of desperation that shows in the character is just, it, it literally turns the song. And just, I don't think there are many people who can, get that depth and that development into just one line and just put it out there and, and the whole thing hinges on it. it. It's really, the writing on this record is really something special, at least in my opinion. Well, thank you. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't remember, I remember where I was when I got that line and it did make the whole song come together. And it wasn't long after Ross told me to get with it because we're going <laughs> in whether you got songs or not. You know. it, it's been interesting talking to artists during this whole, you know, 18 months with no touring. I mean, some have really embraced technology while others want nothing to do with it. You do a lot of regular live Facebook concerts and just playing, you know, from your studio with a guitar at what point when you saw that touring was going to shut down, did you make the decision of sort of embracing this new idea of playing to the masses online? Right away. Because mm -hmm. it was the only way I was going to get any income. 
<laughs> you know, and, and early on, you know, people tipped pretty heavy in those first few months, and then into the fall, the unemployment started running out, so it kind of mm. tailed off. But they're, they're still they're still very generous, and I, I appreciate them because <laughs> what else are you gonna do? I mean, I have started to go back to live stuff every so often, and every time I do, something happens. Mm. You know, I, I was supposed to restart my Continental Club residency in Austin a month ago. And then um, Delta started hitting, and yeah. a lot of my musician friends got sick. Hmm. They didn't get deathly ill because they're all vaccinated, mm -hmm. but they got sick. And so, what we're, we've learned about Delta is, you know, it can infect. You know, vaccinated people can transmit it among to each other, and unfortunately, they can transmit it to their young children who are too young to get vaccinated. And that's what's. Uh, my, my fear is we're about to see a real nightmare among kids now i mean houston texas has 50 children in icu wow and that's and and everybody's running out of beds down here because abbott won't let municipalities impose mask mandates mm -hmm. right? he won't even let like restaurants there are two restaurants in austin tried to you know to you know, to say you can't come in without a vax card and a mask and they were immediately threatened with losing their tabc liquor license Jeez. You know, that, that's what, what's going on down here. It's gotten so political, and Republicans are so desperate to hang on to power that they're going to mm. let people die. Mm. They're, in fact, going to make people die yeah. so that they can look meaner than the next guy. I mean, like, Abbott has to look meaner than any Republican because if he does his job as a governor and as a responsible governor, he'll get voted out mm -hmm. because, you know, Republicans can't do mask mandates. Mm -hmm. or they're out of character they're not real republicans that's what yeah. gets thrown at them so you know abbott's in a bind but uh, but uh, he mm -hmm. should just take a stand and yeah. worry about and, the people not his damn political career amen and, and I, I know you come out and supported jason isbell's yeah you know idea that he's not playing anywhere that doesn't require vax cards and masks yeah, I know I'll play you have doors without that, but I won't yeah. play indoors without it. I mean, I know you have a lot of dates coming up, and granted, you know, different yeah. types of venues, but I do really you... don't. I, I've canceled yeah. most of that. Most of that September oh, okay. is gone. Yeah. The only thing I'm doing, I'm going to Arizona and New Mexico. I found some places out there. Mm -hmm. the, the one indoor gig will require, you know, vax and, and mask. And actually, one of the outdoor gigs does, uh, the Club Congress in Tucson. Mm -hmm. They're, but Tucson's not like the rest of Arizona. It's like a little piece of California that broke off and floated out there. <laughs> in, in Tucson, you see people wearing masks on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. in Phoenix, not so much. We had to, you know, we had a gig. We had to pull out of a, a gig in, in Phoenix, and but somebody found us another venue that would honor our protocol. So mm -hmm. to reward the brave, we're going out there and doing that. <laughs> And, and I mean, it's different all over the country. I mean, I know I'm up here in Connecticut in the Northeast. It's, you know, more people are getting vaccinated, more wearing masks, even if they don't have to. Um, any thoughts of kind of looking and sort of touring where the protections are? Or, you can't do that because yeah. you can't route. You lose mm -hmm. money trying to go across the red states. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, that's a probably it has to be blanket it has to be whole country hmm. and you know suddenly but anything you know, if federal government tries to do anything then you know they're restarting the civil war it's all about hmm. government overreach and i don't understand why like the the federal government telling the state of texas what to do is government overreach but the state of texas can tell austin what to do and <laughs> it's patriotism <laughs> you know i don't this is just ridiculous <laughs> Well, and, you know, kind of steering things back a little, I mean, the record, it's called The Horses and the Hounds. It's out everywhere August 20th. And, you know, we, we talked a little earlier about, you know, kind of how these songs are written and, you know, you're not the type to kind of always be writing and doing it for a project. So were these all songs that really came to fruition just for this record? Or yeah. do you have anything sort of in the vault that kind of comes out for these types of things? Well, I, I've got a, I work from a scrap pile on a laptop, mm -hmm. basically. I just scroll through the notes app, and you know, every now and then I'll find a piece of a song that happens to fit the same rhyme and meter scheme as the last piece of a song I was looking at. <laughs> and sometimes I can stick them together and get a whole song. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, 
but yeah, they, these songs belong as much to the record as they do to me because, like, mm -hmm. you know, we pulled the trigger and suddenly the songs came in. Yeah. And there, there was a certain amount of adrenaline to it, but, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know why these songs came in, particular songs came in when they did. Mm -hmm. they well, did. we've been spending some time here with James McMurtry. The record is called The Horses and the Hounds. It's out everywhere August 20th. Uh, and as we were talking even before the interview started, this is easily going to be one of my top two or three records of the year. Um, it just grabbed me from the second I heard it. Uh, and I know you have uh, quite a bit available on your website. You have some signed vinyl and things like that. So definitely encourage everyone to take a look at your website and check out the merchandise you have there, different versions of the record. And James, thank you so much for taking some time to do this. Um, best of luck with the record. Hopefully things will clear up. You'll be able to tour behind it soon. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. So, and uh, like I said, hopefully we can catch you up north when the country straightens out and you can start doing yeah, a full tour again. <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll figure out some way to work at some point in the future, but I wouldn't expect it to straighten out. <laughs> And people can also find you live on Facebook pretty regularly right off of your Facebook page, correct? And, and YouTube and Twitch. Okay. I do, I do a simultaneous, uh, yeah, I, they, I go to that restream thing and they, mm. they can go out to multiple formats at once. YouTube has a little bit better video and audio than Facebook. Twitch mm. has the best, but I only have about two Twitch viewers. That's <laughs> kind of a gaming thing. But the people seem to like Facebook because it's easy, so much easier to interact. Yeah. But now, like one of the things Restream does is you, the the Facebook people and the YouTube people come up on the same screen. They can mm. they can interact now. Oh, that's great. But I, I do recommend a YouTube. I just, <laughs> Definitely, so. James. Thanks a lot. Best of luck with the record, and we'll catch up again sometime soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you.